coral reefs are like the rainforests of the ocean. They are incredibly biodiverse areas found in waters with little or no nutrients. Over millions of years, the cumulative work of tiny coral polyps has built vast formations that support the living corals and huge numbers of other plant and animal species. Some of the polyps have a mutually beneficial relationship with a special algae. This makes the coral part plant and part animal. Like so many of Earth's complex ecosystems, coral reefs are under stress. Tropical corals do not grow at depths greater than 30 metres, and shallow water reefs only occur in a band between 30 degrees north and south of the equator. Primitive coral reefs first emerged about 500 million years ago. Today, reefs are threatened by overfishing, by pollution, and by increased levels of carbon dioxide that is making the ocean slightly more acidic. Recently, the coral reefs of the Isla de Coco, off the coast of Costa Rica, became the focus of an expedition by a consortium of Latin American and New Zealand scientists. In the early 20th century, the region was frequented by treasure hunters, searching for the riches rumoured to have been left behind by sea pirates in the previous century. Scientists aboard the Proteus expedition say that around 90% of the Isla de Coco reefs died in the early 1980s, when the Pacific's Southern Oscillation Index, also known as El Niño, resulted in a rise in the Pacific's surface temperatures. The reefs are some of the most extensive and richest coral formations in the southeast Pacific, with 32 different species of coral and unusually large gatherings of pelagic sharks. Recent evidence also suggests that the zone plays a critical role as a distribution centre for the eggs of marine species coming from as far as the Indo-Pacific region. The scientists are making an inventory of the marine life in the area to analyse how far the reef has recovered in the last few decades. The cold waters off the Scottish Hebrides are home to a unique cold water coral ecosystem. A joint research expedition between the Scottish Association for Marine Science and Greenpeace has been examining the reef 150 metres below the surface off the island of Mingalay. This is very cold water and the research team use roaming cameras to learn more about the site. The reefs have been formed by a single species of coral, Lophelia pertusa, which developed since the end of the last ice age 8,000 years ago. Deep sea cold water coral reefs are found around the world, but very little is known about them. Many have been badly affected by destructive fishing practices. The Scottish team wants answers to basic questions, like what the deep sea corals eat and how much energy they need for their different functions of life. Knowledge gained here may help protect similar cold water reefs. Australia's Great Barrier Reef is the country's most valuable tourist asset, so it has been declared a marine sanctuary. Tourist activity is concentrated in certain areas, like Agincourt Reef. Every year, tens of thousands of visitors come to the area, but some say these numbers present a threat to the reef's delicate balance. The tourist industry generates more than four billion Australian dollars annually, so dive companies, boat operators and the local resort industry are all keen to protect the reef. Now researchers are starting to realise that protecting the reef could have a different commercial benefit. They have found that corals convert damaging ultraviolet light into safer and more useful forms of energy and they've managed to isolate these properties for use in future sunscreen and cosmetics. Many subtle claims, including skin protection, are made for these products, but a genuine sunscreen without a heavy oil base is very attractive to cosmetic manufacturers. 
Australia enjoys a beach culture, but the country also has one of the highest rates of skin cancer, directly linked to exposure to the sun. The proteins that protect coral from ultraviolet light also give it its vast array of colours. Marine researchers at the University of Queensland have isolated these proteins and have been trialling their use in a new generation of sunscreen products. Such discoveries are prompting researchers to look more closely at the coral reef ecosystem. The venom in a particular variety of jellyfish is being studied by medical researchers who believe it could lead to a radically different variety of anaesthetics and painkillers. Since 2004, a strictly no fishing policy has been imposed across one third of the interlinked chain of reefs. Already, marine biologists are seeing dramatic evidence that protected fish populations have recovered rapidly after years of heavy fishing. The coral trout has made a spectacular recovery across the no fishing zones. Osprey Reef is an isolated seamount in the Coral Sea off the northern Great Barrier Reef. The different shark species in this region make it one of only four of the world's predator diversity hotspots. Little is known about the basic biology of tropical sharks. In recent years, shark numbers in this region have suffered as a result of illegal fishing operations. Recently, the Australian branch of the WWF called on the Australian Government to declare the entire Coral Sea region a marine protected area to shield its predatory habitants from illegal fishing activities. The WWF raised concern about fishing raids to the area for shark fins, which are very popular in the Asian markets. Many shark species, including the grey, the great hammerhead, the white tip and great whites feed in the area. The sharks of the Osprey Reef region are now the focus of a new research program. One species in the area that does not need protecting is the crown of thorns starfish. When conditions are right, they grow to plague proportions, devastating the hard corals in the area. Over the last 40 years, three major outbreaks have had a huge impact on parts of the Great Barrier Reef. It was thought that some imbalance was occurring that allowed this explosive increase in starfish populations. The tourist industry was unhappy and politicians stepped in, at one stage even offering a bounty for captured starfish. Now, marine biologists think that they are part of the natural cycle of life on a coral reef. Healthy reefs will recover between outbreaks, but areas under environmental stress can take much longer to regenerate. The largest archipelagic nation in the world, Indonesia, has more than 17,500 islands and a coastline of around 81,000 kilometres. The country's coral reefs cover about 7,500 square kilometres, but these coral reefs are shrinking rapidly through a combination of global warming and irresponsible fishing. Coral bleaching occurs when rising temperatures expel tiny algae from the coral. The coral's colour and food come from the algae called zooxanthella, and when they disappear the coral turns white. Only 10% of bleached corals survive. Marine scientist Kutut Sudiata discovered widespread coral bleaching in the reefs surrounding Bali. But the news from Indonesia is not all bad. In a recent survey, Conservation International has identified two new types of shark, a previously unknown flasher fish, and 20 new species of corals in seas off Indonesia, confirming the Western Pacific as the richest marine habitat on Earth. They urged more protection for seas around the Bird's Head Peninsula at the western end of New Guinea. Local factors such as mining can pollute the seas and the particularly irresponsible practice of dynamite fishing smashes coral reefs. Among other finds, 
were eight previously unknown types of shrimp and 24 new species of fish, including two types of epaulette shark. The survey region, covering about 18,000 square kilometres, had a greater concentration of species than Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Indonesia's Fisheries Ministry wants to increase the number of marine protected areas currently covering only 11% of the area around the peninsula. Other threats include the expansion of human populations in the little developed region, as well as both logging and mining on the steep coastal hillsides that result in muddy sediments that can choke corals. Indonesia is home to 488 species of the 500 reef species in the world. The Great Barrier Reef, covering an area 10 times bigger, has slightly more types of fish, 1,464 species, but just 405 species of coral. In eastern Indonesia, at the north of Flores Island, the remote area of Riung is naturally beautiful, but it is one of the poorest provinces in Indonesia. There is no oil, gas, mining or industry here. The land is poor and little grows except rice and coconuts. Many women weave traditional fabrics, which take a month to complete each. The people of Nusa Tenggara Timur province are working with environmental organisations by replanting coral reefs and mangrove forests. Here, fishing vessels come ashore after a long night at sea. Sometimes the catch is plentiful, sometimes there's nothing. In the past, a deadly mixture of kerosene and nitrate was used to bomb the reef and ensure a plentiful catch of fish. Now, the fishermen have different ideas. The WWF has regular meetings with the fishermen and together they discuss their long-term needs and how best to look after the area. For survival, the population is dependent on a length of coast which measures 219,000 kilometres in length, an area which has been declared a marine park. Fish bombings had severely depleted the entire ecosystem and catches had become sparse. The WWF, along with more than 200 locals, dropped 90 concrete blocks with live coral down to the ocean floor. The coral grows, on average, about an inch each year. After a year, fish populations are starting to recover and the area is already attracting tourists. In the past, mangroves at the edge of the sea were also chopped down. They are essential to stop soil erosion and also act as a breeding ground for fish. The WWF, along with the community, has embarked on an ambitious replanting program. Children replant mangroves with enthusiasm. A seed is taken from a mangrove tree and placed in a small pot with wet mud. It is left for six months and then replanted on the beach with a 90% success rate. In Ryung, a new environmental awareness is dawning. The people want any kind of development to involve all levels of society. Yet, despite improvements, some areas of the reef will take years to recover. Once, the corals along the shores of the Red Sea would draw divers keen to see one of the most spectacular and biologically diverse reefs in the world. Nowadays, these corals are facing extinction, along with the colourful translucent fish, because of a lucrative fish farm industry in the region's waters. Only 30% of the corals and the wild fish life in the area remain. Zalul, an environmental group, has been conducting a campaign, including lectures and the distribution of underwater footage, presenting the destruction of the coral reef. The fish farms located in the Gulf, breeding five million fish a year, are the major source of organic pollution that has been killing the coral reefs. The reefs had sustained damage for years, as Eilat and the neighbouring Jordanian Red Sea resort of Aqaba grew from isolated desert outposts into tourist boom towns. 
but experts claim that the most severe damage began in the early 1990s, after fish companies started large-scale breeding programs. When the fish farms were established, the reefs should have regenerated as a new sewage plant began to treat waste generated by the growing resort population. Instead, coral degradation accelerated and new coral growth dropped to near zero. Marine biologists say that fish cages, which have continued to increase despite huge opposition, have been excreting large amounts of nitrates that encourage plankton, the enemy of corals, as they make the seawater murky, blocking sunlight, which is essential for coral survival. A report by international scientists found the fish cages were contributing to around 90% of nitrates entering the sea around the resorts. For years, the fish farms continued to deny any direct link with the coral decline, saying that this form of aquaculture is actually environmentally friendly because it eases the pressure on wild fish populations. Their opponents worried that before exhaustive studies could prove the link between the coral's decline and the fish farms, the corals would have long disappeared. The connection between a high concentration of nitrates and the decline of corals is widely accepted by marine scientists. Experts were vocal that the reefs could only be saved if the fish farms were eliminated, or at least relocated, to ponds that would allow the treatment of their waste waters. The reefs in Aqaba, or along the adjacent Sinai Peninsula, are in far better shape than those off Eilat, despite thriving tourist industries. Finally, after years of political agitation, the fish farms are closing, but marine biologists fear that it may be too late. The reefs have been devastated, and conditions that will encourage their recovery and regrowth can only be viewed in filtered aquariums. To reduce pressure on the area so the corals can recover naturally, it was decided to build an artificial reef so that divers could see the colourful marine life without disturbing delicate regrowth areas. Other resorts have used shipwrecks as artificial reefs to attract divers, but this project is one of the first to construct a purpose-built reef using specially designed concrete with silicon to hold coral in place. The artificial reef is the size of a small house made up of six concrete blocks, each weighing four tons. To help with the regeneration, marine biologists are growing rare species of coral in nurseries and hope to create a flourishing community within five years. Without positive human intervention, the same regrowth could take as much as 100 years. Thousands of divers and snorkelers flock to the popular Red Sea resort region to marvel at the spectacular ocean life attracted by its coral reefs. But intensive diving will hamper the coral's recovery, and researchers wanted to protect it without restricting tourism in the popular area. Hulking blocks of concrete might not appear attractive, but after just a few months in the water, the reef has already attracted more than 20 species of fish, and as time passes, the corals will spread across the whole structure. The artificial reef near Eilat's popular coral beach diving spot was started as an experiment, but researchers say if it proves a hit with divers and protects the reef, it could be replicated elsewhere. Once the coral is ready, divers plant it into holes drilled into the concrete blocks. The project will also provide a research base for marine biologists, since some 40 different types of corals are clustered on a 10 metre strip of Red Sea coral reef, compared to four or five in the same area on a natural reef. The reef's developers are not trying to imitate the natural community, rather they are attempting to give advantage to rare species on the verge of extinction. Rehabilitation of a different type was needed in the waters around Thailand's Phi Phi Island. Years after the tsunami had devastated regions across Asia, 
the waters around this holiday area were still filled with debris, ranging from plastic chairs to fishing nets. Boatloads of divers were organised to help clear away the tsunami debris, littering Thailand's famed coral reefs. At least 100 volunteer divers from across Thailand joined the clean-up mission organised by the Marine Biological Centre, based 50 kilometres north of Phuket town. Recreational divers working nine to five jobs strapped on their diving gear to survey the damage around PP Island to plan the massive clean-up effort. Marine experts said the overall damage was not as bad as initially feared and that nature's own clean-up process had already started. Initial surveys suggested some of the reefs around PP Island, which attract thousands of snorkeling and diving tourists each year, had escaped unscathed. Large chunks of coral did snap off in some areas with the force of the rushing surge of debris, but most of the reefs were still alive and would continue to grow. While the tsunami rose to a height of up to 11 metres above normal sea levels when it crashed ashore around PP, under the surface of the water there appeared to have been relatively little movement. Local dive companies, dependent on the thousands of leisure divers that flock to the area each year, fear rumours of wrecked coral will drive them out of business. While shallow reefs were damaged, they say the spectacular deep water corals are still pristine. Biologists say the rich underwater ecosystem around Pipi will continue to support the variety of marine life that includes eels, sea snakes and turtles. In the long term, local conservationists are hoping the disaster will slow the rampant overdevelopment on PP Island. The clearing operation was a success, with huge amounts of junk removed from the waters. After the disaster, most of the buildings on the island lay in ruins. People are hoping that the recovery of the island's tourist infrastructure will happen in a more planned manner.